The Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, said his favorite book apart from the Bible was John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. He said he read it easily as hundreds of times, and I want you to hear from him what he said about John Bunyan. He wrote this, Oh, that you and I might get into the very heart of the Word of God and get that Word into ourselves. It is idle merely to let the eye glance over the words or to recollect the poetic, poetic expressions or the historical facts. I would quote John Bunyan as an instance of what I mean. Read anything of his and you will see that it is almost like reading the Bible itself. He had read it till his very soul was saturated with scripture. And though his writings are full of poetry, yet he cannot give us his pilgrim's progress, that sweetest of all prose poems, without continually making us feel and say, Why, this man is a living Bible. Prick him anywhere. His blood is Bibline. With that being said, I want to give you a few helpful, a bite-sized biographical sketch of who John Bunyan was. And then some ways that he has helped me particularly think about theology and who the Lord is. So first, who was John Bunyan? Here are some helpful events in church history to kind of give you an idea of where John Bunyan was at. In 1611, we have the King James Bible. In 1618, the Synod of Dort meets for the first time. In 1628, John Bunyan is born. And in 1688, John Bunyan dies. And as many of you probably know, in 1689... The year after John Bunyan dies, we have the London, the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. So John Bunyan was born in November 1628 to a very poor family in Elstow, which is about a mile from Bedford in England. His father was a tinker, which means he mended pots and small utensils. John Bunyan had no higher education. His parents were not wealthy but they were able to send him off to a school to learn to read and write, which I find particularly helpful because I am not as educated as I would like to be, but Bunyan was so feeble in his education, yet he could write in such an influential and biblical way. As a young man, John Bunyan recalls that he was, quote, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, from Ephesians chapter 2. He said that he was one of the most foul-mouthed people that he met. He writes this about himself. When it came to cursing, swearing, lying, and blaspheming the holy name of God, I had few equals, especially considering my very young age. Uh, once John Bunny was standing from a storefront and he was cursing and swearing. And there was a woman who worked there who he called a very known loose woman in the, in the, in the town. And she herself was stunned by his foul language. The age of 15, his mother and his sister both die within a month of each other. And following this, John Bunny would join the army at merely 16 years old. And there's a very well-known story Bunny tells when he is he's on the line, he's told to, to charge, and John Bunny pauses and he doesn't want to go. And during this, he stays back and another man says, I will take your place. And John remembers this man running ahead of him and being shot right in the head. As if John Bunyan should have, man that, should have been the man that was shot. When he was 20, he married his first wife, which we don't know her name. We think it was probably Mary because often the daughters were named after their mother. But we don't know, but we know that they're both very poor. And she only really brought two things into her marriage, which were two books by two Puritans. And he recalls the reading those at times with his wife, but never feeling any biblical conviction. During these years, he would attend a church, he would hear sermons, and he would even feel remorse for his sins. He actually recalls a time where the most convicting thing that happened to him was a sermon from the book, The Songs of Solomon. And he said hearing that sermon brought him great guilt. He said he had a great burden upon his back. Bunyan began to read his own Bible, he said, to merely reform himself, to be morally upright. He thought he could actually find his way to heaven by doing what the Bible commands. He realized his guilt. He was so scared that he would go to the church. He would see the church bell ring. He would hear it. And he was fearful that the, the, the bell would fall and crush him. He was scared that, well, if, if, I st if I stand under a pillar, 
I'll be safe, but the bell might bounce off, hit the pillar, and then hit me. John Bunyan was terrified of death. He had dreams of God condemning him. He had thoughts about his own sinfulness. And yet he kept keeping the law, hoping the law would comfort him with its lengthy, tireless demands. Bunyan's conversion was one that seemed to be very steady over time, with multiple encounters with his scriptures. One, we, one man in particular is his pastor named John Gifford, who pastored a local congregation in Bedford. John Bunyan loved Pastor Gifford. He spoke of him many times. Bunyan talks about spending time pouring over the Bible and yet never finding rest for his soul. He said he was scared of God's judgment. He believed that he was unsavable. He believed that the devil told him that he was a reprobate, that Satan tried to lure him away time after time. And then, in a beautiful day, John Bunyan records this bright day amidst these clouds. He says this, One day as I was passing through the field, Suddenly this sentence fell upon my soul. Thy righteousness is in heaven. And with the eyes of my soul, I thought I saw Jesus Christ at God's right hand. There, I say, was my righteousness. So wherever I was or whatever I was doing, God could not say of me, He lacks my righteousness, for it was right before Him. For my righteousness was Jesus Christ Himself, the same yesterday and today and forever. And Bunyan thought, this is so rich, but I need a verse to solidify this. And his mind went to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, where we read this. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Bunyan's entire wrestle with doubt and feelings were greatly remedied by this text. Later, him and his family moved to Bedford, where he was baptized by immersion in the Bedford River. Then about five or six years later, he found himself preaching his first sermon in 1656 at Pastor Gifford's church. John then began to preach outdoors. He said that hundreds of people would show up outdoors to see him preach open air. And this is where the trouble began. John Owen once went to go hear John Bunyan preach. And King Charles II asked John Owen why someone as educated as you would want to hear this tinker preach. And John Owen replied with these great words, If I could could possess the tinker's ability to touch men's hearts, I would gladly give in exchange all my learning. Once John Bunyan actually filled in where John Owen preached at, and the church was too full to fill, that was too full to hold anybody else. During this time, however, John Bunyan's wife would die. And he would remarry Elizabeth in 1659. This is where it gets interesting. After five years of preaching outdoors at other congregations as well, John was arrested for refusing to stop preaching without a license from the Church of England in 1660, nearly a year after he was married. So newly wed and arrested. He was allowed to literally walk out of prison at any time that he wanted if he would simply renounce preaching. But Bunyan would not do so. He stood in prison. His wife encouraged him all the way for 12 whole years. During this time, much of his writing actually came, up, came to be. He made shoelaces that would, that would fund his family, provide money. He was actually allowed to sneak out of the jail to see his family by some of the guards who liked him. Bunyan said he would rather sit in jail and have moss grow over his eyes than to stop preaching. During this time of pain and distress, Elizabeth, his wife, would miscarry because of the sorrowful in God's testing, yet she remained steadfast by Bunyan's side. Finally, in 1672, there's light. By God's providence, King Charles II issues a declaration of religious indulgence, which freed men like Bunyan to exit and not be imprisoned anymore. The laws were removed for penalty. And he'd be licensed as a pastor in Bedford for the next 16 years. Uh, Theologically, Bunyan was puritanical. He was a Calvinist in soteriology and also a credo-baptist, which was not popular during his time. He would die in 1688 at the age of 60. And he died on his way back from, from preaching. He rode about 50 miles to meet with a father and his son to reconcile some differences. 
and he rode on, through on a storm, became very wet, became very cold, and he actually died in a fever at their house on the way back. Over the course of 60 years, John Bunyan wrote about 60 books, tracts, and pamphlets. He was a faithful preacher, a faithful witness to God's goodness, and a bold believer during these times against the gospel. So that's Bunyan. He's a rich man spiritually. I want to share with you four doctrinal truths that Bunyan has grown for me personally that I've learned from him. Number one, God's merciful providence. One of my favorite narratives in the New Testament is in the book of Acts, chapter 8, and the angel of the Lord says to Philip, rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem. This is a desert place. Philip goes, and then we read the famous story where he runs into the Ethiopian eunuch, who is a court official who just happens to be reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip is told by the Spirit to run to this man and to talk to him. He does. He hears the eunuch reading this section, which is what we would call the gospel according to Isaiah. And Philip asks him if he understands this. The eunuch says he needs help. Philip then opens his mouth. And beginning with this scripture, he tells him the good news about Jesus. The eunuch is converted, baptized, and Philip just jets off. This entire narrative can be summed up in one word. It's providence. God seeks out sinners, preserves their lives, orders their steps, unfolds his plans in and through, by or over, against our own. This is Bunyan's life. It's a sweet reminder of it. He knew that he was worse than all those who profess goodness and yet were ungodly. He actually writes this in his own autobiography. However, God did not utterly leave me as an unbeliever. He still followed me. And he did not follow me with convictions, but with judgments. Yet they were such as were mixed with mercy. Mercy yet preserved me alive. Probably no, most not- noticeable in his life was this moment leading to his conversion. It's one of my favorites. While working as a tinker, he went to Bedford and he had passed by a house and he heard these three or four women talking on the porch, talking about gospel things, things about their church and about theology. And he had no clue what they were talking about. He was so confused what they were saying. But he recalls the phrases, new birth, the work of God in their hearts, and how they're convinced of their miserable natural state. They talk about how God visited them with their souls and the love of Christ. He says he felt as if they were above him in their understandings. And later, these women are the ones who brought him to John Gifford, that pastor. This was so impactful because in his view, God was terrifying. And these ladies knew the truth that the Lord is merciful and he's rich. And that Bunny was not those things. Bunny said that they spoke so biblically and graciously that he said he found a new world in talking to them. These words bothered him at work, but he continued purposely to walk by and to listen to these women day after day as they talked outside. And the Lord, as you can tell, was working in his heart. Bunyan had a relatability in his understanding of his former life as one sprinkled with God's grace. And this perspective is so biblically rich that it helps me to anchor my soul when I, too, question God's work in my life. Therefore, we must not lose confidence in the power of God and His providence to guide us, to lead us, to preserve us, and to restrain all things according to His sovereignty. At one point, he came across some popular books being published in London by a strong wave of antinomians, which means anti-law. Those who hold that grace overcomes the, the moral law as a license to sin. And even as an unbeliever, he read these books and he thought, this doesn't feel right. So an unbeliever in God's province just understood there's something off about this. He writes this later, Oh, these temptations were, were attractive to me, to my flesh. But God, who had, I hope, designed for me better things, kept me in the fear of Him and did not allow me to accept these principles. So you you can just look back at Bunny's entire life. Even as an unbeliever, God is ordering and leading and guiding and protecting from false doctrine. God's mercy. Secondly, Bunyan taught me that Christians are strangers. Pilgrim's Progress really is one of the most helpful books I've ever read. It's allegorical in nature. All of its characters are involved in a story to portray biblical truth, wisdom, gospel hope, 
and Christian realities that I read, and even now when I read the scriptures. The book features a man named Christian who is, leave, who is living in the city of destruction, who learns of his miserable condition, convi- condition with a burden on his back because he read the book. The story portrays him finding a great burden, having fear. He meets a man named Evangelist who tells him, flee from the wrath to come. And he's sent on his way to the narrow gate to find relief from his burden and to one day reach the celestial city. At one point, Christian and his newfound companion, Faithful, come to a town called Vanity Fair, where they hold this fair year-round. But he describes it as a fair not recently created, but one that has ancient roots. The fair is ran by one named Apollyon, Beelzebub, and Legion, And their aim is to sell all kinds of worthless things, such as houses, lands, businesses, places, honors, promotions, titles, countries, kingdoms, desires, pleasures, and delights of all sorts, such as prostitutes, brothels, wives, husbands, children, masters, servants, lives, blood, bodies, souls, silver, gold, pearls, precious stones, and so forth. And the way to Celestial City, you have to pass through Vanity Fair. Unless you die. Bunyan then describes that the normal Christian life is one as if you feel and look and you sound peculiar in life. You do not belong on earth is how you feel. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, we read that Christians are called strangers and exiles, meaning that we must abstain from the passions and lusts that only wage war with our souls. This is Bunyan's point in Vanity Fair. We are pilgrims who are passing through. We don't belong here. We must preserve our souls from these worldly pleasures. And in doing so, we look right through them and we look peculiar by living here. In the story, as Christian and faithful pass through Vanity Fair, the people who are selling, they stare at them and they have looks and they think they're very peculiar. And they say there's a great hubbub in in the town because three things... Mark these men out. Number one, their dress. They looked different from those who traded at the fair. Number two, their speech. If you could understand them, they seemed as barbarians, as if they spoke the language of Canaan. And number three, most shockingly to the merchants, the pilgrims didn't even look at what was sold. They were called to buy from these things, and instead they would put their fingers in their ears. They would look upward and say that their trade was in heaven. And they would cry out, Turn my eyes away from these worthless things. At one point, they would respond to these men who were selling, We buy the truth. Meaning, truth is not found in Vanity Fair. Bunyan emphasized the truth of worldly loves contrasted with the full and lasting pleasure at God's right hand, found namely in Jesus Christ. We all live in a Vanity Fair. But we must look through these things to the treasure of Christ. He writes this, Christ is the desire of nations, the joy of angels, the delight of the Father. What solace then must that soul be filled with who has the possession of him to all eternity? The Christian life is one that looks strange to those who are on earth. The Christian has a different love, different thinking, different acting. In short, Christians are pilgrims. During his sentence in the Bedford jail, he would stand before judges that would meet him in the courts to discuss his imprisonment, and they'd ridicule him because they thought he was so strange that he would not just stop preaching and just leave. Every day, Christians, we must remember our strangeness. We are peculiar. We are designed for another world. And John Bunyan lived and thought and preached and wrote in such a way. Number three, law and gospel. During Bunyan's life, he had a constant struggle with the relationship between the law and the gospel. This distinction is not only helpful, but it hangs but it hangs upon your eternity. It's important in the Christian life. This truth was so important to Bunyan that there are multiple sites of this in Pilgrim's Progress. Specifically, this is called the Doctrine of Law and Grace Unfolded in a book that he wrote. This book makes sense not only because did Bunyan struggle with this connection between law and gospel before conversion, but he was also greatly helped by reading 
Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Galatians. In his book, Law and Grace Unfolded, he writes this very helpful opening to the reader. I want to read it to you. If thou wouldst know the authority and power of the gospel, labor first to know the power and authority of the law. For I am verily persuaded that the want of this one thing, namely the knowledge of the law, is one cause why so many are ignorant of the other, namely the gospel. If thou wouldst then wash thy face clean, first take a glass and see where it is dirty. That is, if thou wouldst indeed have thy sins washed away by the blood of Christ, labor first to see them in the glass of the law, and do not be afraid to see them besmeared condition. John Bunyan rightly understood that, as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7, that we are sinners by knowing the law. The problem is with me. Paul says the law is good. Thus, no one is justified by the law, but only by the work of Christ, imputed to us by faith alone. In the gospel, then, the righteousness of God is manifested apart from the law. This harmonizes very well with Jesus' words in Mark chapter 2, where where Jesus says this, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, Christ will only look to those who see themselves as dead and dying, miserable sinners, for they know their condition and they know their physician, that Christ is all sufficient. In Pilgrim's Progress, Bunyan has such a helpful illustration. He talks about a man named Mr. Worldly Wiseman from the town of Carnal Policy. In their conversation, John Bunyan tells him that he has a desire to have his burden relieved. Mr. Worldly Wiseman directs him to a village called Morality, to a name to a man named Legality. He tells Christian that many people find success in relieving their burdens. And Christian finds this to be true, so he asks for directions. Do you see that high hill over there? You must go by that hill. And the first house you come to is his. So Christian goes, he reaches the hill, and finds the hill is too steep. The overhang is so much that it may crush him, and now his burden actually feels heavier as he goes up the hill. He sees flashes of fire as he goes up this hill. He is unable to, and by God's providence, he is met by a friend who sent him on his way. Evangelist. They have a conversation that reveals what happened to Christian and how familiar are these words. He exhorts Christian to walk by faith in God alone, not on the path that goes to the hill, but on the narrow path. He reassures him of his doubts. So you might be asking, who is this Mr. Mr. Worldly Wiseman? Evangelist explains him that he is a common person in the Christian life. He writes this, He is rightly called the Worldly Wiseman, partly because he finds only the doctrine of this world tasteful, which is why he always goes to the town of morality to attend church, and partly because the doctrine he loves the most is the one that saves him from the suffering associated with the cross. The man was to seek legality, who lived near the hill, is this, Galatians chapter 4, the son of the slave woman, Hagar, is Mount Sinai, This mountain you fear would fall on your head. Legality is not able to set you free from your burden. No one has ever been delivered from his burden by him. No, nor is it ever likely to happen. You can't be justified by works of the law, for no one living can be loosed from his burden by the deeds of the law. This is a picture of the gospel. Bunyan is giving us this beautiful picture that worldly wisdom says, Do, try, obey. The Ten Commandments are your way out. But no one is justified by these. They will only show you that you cannot further keep them. And it only seems to make your burden heavier. Instead, Bunyan gives a helpful picture of how law and gospel go together. Because he did not understand that early on, and many Christians today wrestle with how these things work. He leads leads us into a very large room where it seems to be full of dust because it was never swept. A man comes to sweep away the dust, but as he does so, it only makes it dustier, as you could probably imagine. 
and Krishna begins to choke. So in response, a little girl comes in and she sprinkles it with water. Afterwards, the room is easily swept clean. Bunyan writes and explains this and tells what this means as a man named Interpreter interprets this for us. He writes this, The reception room is the heart of a man that was never sanctified by the sweet grace of the gospel. The dust is the original sin and the inward corruptions that have made the whole man unclean. He who began to sweep in the beginning is the law, but she who brought and sprinkled the water is the gospel. The law is meant to show you that instead of cleaning the sinful heart by its works, the law actually energizes it, puts strength into it, and increases sin in the soul. Even though it rivals and condemns sin, it doesn't have the power to conquer it. Just as the girl settled the dust by sprinkling the floor with water, in like manner, the sweet and precious influences of the gospel to the heart conquer and defeat sin. The soul is made clean through faith in the gospel, and the soul is fit for the king of glory to inhabit. That is such a picture for us to remember. Bunyan rightly understood that the law reveals your sin. It cannot cleanse you. The gospel cleanses your sin through faith. The law only shows you your problem. The gospel is your remedy. And Bunyan helps us so clearly to understand this in this, in this picture. Our righteousness, again, is in heaven. It's not through the law. There's a couplet that Bunyan wrote that we believe he wrote that Spurgeon and others attribute to him, and it says this, Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives me neither feet nor hands. Better news the gospel brings. It bids me fly and gives me wings. Lastly, design and suffering. Those who have been through pain and suffering this life while walking with Christ have a sweet, particular knowledge of the sufficiency of Christ in His power and His love and care. The psalmist writes this in Psalm 119, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. It is good for me, it was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Remarkably, Bunny would say the same things. These were painful, painful times for him in the, in the Bedford jail. Alongside his Bible, we know that Bunyan read over and over Fox's Book of Martyrs to encourage him while he was in jail. It bolstered his faith like shoots of iron within him to keep him grounded. His second wife would actually miscarry one of their babies due to the pain and fears she had while he was away from her. And their six children were sorrowful, one who was blind from birth. He described these 12 years of being taken away from his family as, quote, the pulling of my flesh from my bones. He said his heart would break because of the inability to be there for his family, especially his blind daughter. Also, the judge that was over his sentence would threaten to, quote, lengthen his neck, which means to hang him. So, John sat in a filthy prison for 12 years, in cold winters, very hot summers, poorly rationed food. And yet, in this cell, John Bunyan writes this, In all my life, I have never had so great insight into the Word of God as in the prison. One of his books he wrote was called Seasonable Counsel, which is advice to people who are suffering. And its main thrust is to give light and legs to the text in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. In it, he writes this, There are some of the graces of God that are in thee that cannot show themselves, nor their excellency, nor their power, nor what they can do, but as thou art in a suffering state. So John Bunyan rightly understands that certain things that God works and implants in our heart could only be exposed through suffering, through God's workmen, which is often suffering. He knows that God's sustaining grace is prized and adored more in a suffering state than in calm days. 
In his book, he constantly affirms God's sending of these trials, even those that are brought about by sinful men, as an extension of God's sovereignty. As servants, he writes, of God for thy good. Just imagine 12 years of this prison. He died when he was 60, so that means that 20% of John Bunyan's life was in jail. He could have got out at any time if he would have ceased preaching the gospel. But he didn't. He wisely and beautifully said this, We should be overgrown with flesh if we had not our own seasonable winters. It is said that in some countries trees will grow, but will bear no fruit because there is no winter there. The Lord himself blesses all seasons to his people. He understood that affliction is better than sin. Suffering is better than sinning against God. He writes this, If God sends the one to cleanse us from the other, let us thank him and also be content to pay the messenger. And the messenger is the the affliction. Friends, God has ordained your struggles and pains in his fatherly care. The heavy text of Hebrews 12 reminds us that we must do this, that we might share his holiness. And for the Christian, remember, holiness is happiness. Bunyan said that God's grace and love shown to him in his pain were a demonstration that he can make a jail even more beautiful than a palace. This is a man who was brought to the sweetness of Christ over his life through suffering. He knows that we are called to rejoice in and through all these trials. But he didn't endure these trials because he was so great or so brave or so faithful. He believes rightly so that the enemy has a design in these trials, either directly or indirectly. Bunyan compared the Christian life of suffering in trials as a fire burning next to a wall. And this is the picture I want to close with. Standing by the wall in Pilgrim's Progress was an individual who was continually pouring or throwing water on the fire to get it out. And yet the fire kept burning higher and hotter. The fire, writes Bunyan, is this, the work of grace working in the heart. He who throws water on it to extinguish it is the devil. So why is the fire not going out? On the other side of the wall, Bunyan says there is a man there with a jar of oil in his hand secretly pouring oil upon the fire. That man is Christ. Behind the scenes, sustaining the faith of the believer. The faith already begun in the heart. And like the Christian life, we don't see Christ behind the wall. We just feel the pain. But we trust that He will grow us. Bunyan said this, Let us learn, like Christians, to kiss the rod and love it. In conclusion, to his time in jail, he said this in his autobiography, I would not have traded this trial for anything. I'm comforted every time I think of it, and I hope I shall bless God forever for the things it has taught me. Bunyan indeed is a man who trusts in God's providence, who embraces the strangeness of the Christian life, who understands our need to trust the Lord, and who sees the divine design in our suffering.